Now, why should an organization that is expressly international in outlook adopt such an America-centric orientation? Indeed, I understand that fully 75% of the delegates here in Dawson City are from countries other than the United States. The answer may be found in a quip once made by John Connolly, arguably the worst Treasury Secretary in American history. <laughs> the dollar, he said, is our currency but the world's problem. That may have been the most perceptive thing he ever said about the dollar. <laughs> the fiat dollar is indeed a global problem, but it has its headquarters in the United States. We will be ground zero of the monetary collapse. We will be where the critical choice is posed, repression or regeneration. There won't be many anchors to windward. The Constitution will offer the best hope of pointing people away from tyranny and back toward what Amer made America a positive force in the world through much of its history. It's still on the books, although it is sanctimoniously ignored by judges and politicians. And it still exercises a hold, however superficial, on the political consciousness of most Americans. Consider how different the world would be today if the United States had simply observed its Constitution. Consider how different the world may be tomorrow, after the monetary collapse, if America finds its way home. Now consider the other alternative. If you think we're a rogue elephant on the world stage now, just wait until we are well and truly panicked. So it seems to me we, have all, we all have a stake in the restoration of a constitutional monetary system in the United States, and GATA can and should sign up to play a constructive role here. There's lots to talk about. Not that the Constitution's monetary provisions are all that extensive or all that complicated. In fact, <clears throat> there are only a few in all. I've got two slides that I think will demonstrate what I mean if I get it to work. <clears throat> this uh, first slide of, of only two uh, shows a before and after comparison of the language that relates to the power of Congress to issue paper money. The before text comes from the Articles of Confederation, the predecessor to the Constitution. And here it's helpful to recall that the Constitution did not spring whole from the framers' foreheads at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. It was a carefully studied and extensively debated successor to this original charter. The Articles had been adopted 10 years earlier, shortly after outbreak of the Revolution, and had formally governed relations among the states since 1781. Now, the words used in these old documents carry slightly different meanings today, but their original meanings is clear enough, especially when considered in context. We see here in the language of the before, before text that Congress had originally been given the explicit power to issue paper money, so-called bills of credit. The states also had that power by virtue of the fact that the Articles nowhere said they didn't. <clears throat> the Articles made clear that any power not specifically delegated to the Congress was retained by the sovereign states. Now, we've already heard Jim uh, Turk make reference to this, but in the years running up to the Constitution, or uh, up to the uh, Constitutional Convention, both Congress in uh, the notorious continental currency and the several states in a profusion of unbacked paper emissions had taken full advantage of this power. The result was a disaster. The delegates who had arrived in Philadelphia straight from their home states that were suffering varying degrees of financial and economic distress were determined to implement a lasting monetary reform. And one of the first things they did, right here in Article 1, was take away from Congress the power to issue paper money by deleting the language or to emit bills. Now, you see that in the uh, slide under the caption after, right? Yeah. Um, now, this illustrates um, an important point, and namely that what the Constitution doesn't do is often just as important as what it does do. That's because every power exercised by government has to have a root authorization in the Constitution. What isn't expressly authorized is prohibited. That's the genius of the limited state conceived by the framers. The second slide is another before and after comparison, again showing the change in the reform document in contrast with the defective original. In before, we are reminded by the reference or by that of the respective states 
that under the Articles, the states have been free to coin their own money. Congress, however, had been given exclusive power to regulate the alloy of any coins struck by Congress and or the several states, as well as the value, that is the exchange rate, based on precious metal content of the various state and federal coins. In after, we see the heart of the monetary provisions in the successor constitution. Now, several things are going on here in Clause 1 of uh, Section 10. First, we see that the states have lost their power to coin money. Second, we see that the Congress retained that power, as well as the power to regulate the value, the exchange rate, again, based on precious metal content of coins that it struck but this time as against the foreign coins that were then in general circulation rather than the coins struck by the states. Third, we see that the states were explicitly denied the power to issue paper money. Finally, and this is one of the most intriguing provisions of all, we see that the states were denied the power to make anything but gold and silver coin a legal tender, which would include, I would point out, anything issued by the federal government. By the way, this gold and silver uh, clause is the basis for the monetary reform proposal that uh, James Turk and uh, Edwin Vera are working on in New Hampshire. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, that's it. That's the sum total of the core monetary provisions of the Constitution. You now know more about this subject than almost all of the guys in charge in Washington. As my Canadian friends would say, sobering thought, eh? <laughs> Now, what the framers actually had in mind for a monetary system that would be consistent with the Constitution can be seen in an implementing statute, the so-called Coinage Act of 1792. This law was passed by a Congress whose members included a number of the framers. The Coinage Act did a number of very constructive things. It provided for the establishment of a national mint. It regulated the weight and fineness of a series of gold and silver coins. It opened up the new mint to all comers, thus, crucially, leaving the determination of the money supply to the market. It provided that the gold and silver coins minted would be legal tender, but only proportionate to their weight. Nobody's perfect, though, not even the framers in the early Congress. The Coinage Act, in addition to getting a number of things right, also made a very grave error. It attempted to regulate directly the value ratio between gold and silver coins rather than properly leaving this process to the market. The results over the next succeeding 200 years were poor, to say the least. I would point out that this error is corrected uh, in the modern discussion draft that uh, Antal Fekete has prepared in the appendix that I mentioned previously. So you can see we have uh, lots to talk about. Just to say you're for a constitutional monetary system doesn't really say anything about its specific form and content. <clears throat> That's because the Constitution is a free market charter. For example, it uses the term dollar in two places outside the core monetary provisions. The term refers to the Spanish mill dollar of 371 and a quarter grains silver in common use in North America. But the Constitution doesn't define the term. It doesn't even define money, other than to say it's something that is coined rather than printed. No, the Constitution takes money as it finds it in the market and empowers Congress to coin it as well. In fact, the Constitution really doesn't care what people use in their private um, dealings. Now, in a legal system in which all powers exercised by or on behalf of the state must derive from a specific enumerated power in the Constitution, the absence of authority to issue fiat money or to establish a central bank should have been enough to keep these things from becoming the defining features of our monetary system. Instead, over the years, politicians and judges turned the Constitution upside down, either ignoring it altogether or pretending that it permitted anything not expressly prohibited. So given where we find ourselves, we have a number of issues to sort out if we're going to return to a constitutional system. I'll just throw out two big ones that I find particularly interesting. First is, how should we separate bank from state? Now, it's not enough to recognize that there is no authority in the Constitution whatsoever for the establishment of a central bank. We have one, and its carcass will still be with us following the collapse. Now, there are, to date, two main schools of thought. 
One is the Let It Die a Natural Death School, which is found in the writings of Edwin Vera and Antal Fekete. The notion is once you reintroduce real money, the paper garbage will soon enough be seen as such and wither away. This is the concept underlying parallel currencies. In fact, it's the concept that uh, animates each of the four reform proposals that are now um, in circulation. The other school is, a, is the drive a stake through its heart school. This notion is the, um, the Fed should be wound up through some sort of receivership process. Unfortunately, the last serious thinking from this school on how to wind up the Fed comes from the late Murray Rothbard. His ruminations related to a still functioning Fed and a pre-collapse environment. So they need a fresh look from a post-collapse perspective. Now, either approach to the emancipation of the state from the banks, even after the collapse, is going to entail a battle royal. The Fed long ago co-opted the economics profession and the financial press. Even in the wreckage of what it has wrought, it will quickly find a new champion to sell an attractive revisionist history and further its agenda of self-preservation and control. The second issue is, what should our national money be? Now, the easy big picture answer is coins struck in gold and silver, the only money recognized as such in the Constitution. But this is far too general to be of any practical use. A number of issues remain. First, what kind of coins? Should they bear traditional names or be designated solely in terms of their weight? This is not a theoretical question, because in the wake of the collapse, it may well turn out to be the case there will be no going back. We will have so abused the concept of the term dollar in referring to the Fed's rag paper and unbacked digital entries that it is conceivable that people will be unwilling to accept an instrument so named. Moreover, if the new unit is given a name rather than a weight, we just invite future politicians and judges to play the dictionary game, continuing the use of the names but incrementally changing their meanings by eliminating the precious metal content or backing over time. This brings up a broader point. Any reform must be crafted defensively with due regard for the reality that it will at best prove a temporary bulwark against steady sapping by the financial elites. Sooner or later, whatever reform, if any, emerges from the collapse will meet the same fate as the original reform that was embodied in the Constitution some 200 years ago. We can't change this reality, but we can make erosion more difficult. The simpler and more transparent the system, the more trouble judges and politicians will have in subverting it. Now, in this connection, there's one, another important point that needs to be addressed. Edwin Vera argues persuasively in his brilliant and authoritative study, Pieces of Eight, that although we're free to use both gold and silver coins, we must use the silver dollar referenced in the Constitution as our national unit of account. This is a fascinating and a provocative position, but it would raise enormous practical difficulties. Moreover, however compelling the inferences upon which this conclusion is based, the fact remains that, as we have seen, the Constitution just doesn't say so explicitly. So is Mr. Vera right? Are we stuck with a silver-denominated monetary system? Or is this a libertarian penumbra? Let's talk about it. Now these two questions, the disposition of the Fed and the nature of successor money, are just the big ones glaring at us on the threshold. There are lots of others, equally in need of articulation and debate including some we've already seen some ink on and heard about today, uh, the uh, role of real bills and the, uh, the nature and, and permissibility of fractional reserve banking, to name, it, to name a couple. Now, this is a start, but we have to take a more active and a more supportive role in hammering out a consensus position, uh, sort of like, you know, proverbial herding cats. The problem is we're only going to get one shot when, when the big one hits. And if we don't get our act together, the odds favoring repression over regeneration will lengthen even further. So in closing, to quote my good friend uh, William J. Murphy III, we got to be in it to win it. Thanks.